Hi, and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, I'm looking at some of the movies I've watched this month because in January 2024, I'm only watching new movies. I'm not watching anything I've seen before. So no re-watches at all. And it's been kind of tough because there have been movies I've remembered and I wanted to watch again. Wasn't able to do it. I've got to stay true to this. I've got to watch at least 31 movies in January that I've never seen before, which is hard for me. I've seen a lot of movies, but the ones I've watched in the last week or so have most mostly been really weird like truly weird each in their own way thought i'd talk about those five weird movies i watched lately i can safely recommend all of them so let's get started with a 2022 movie which did incredibly well in japan because it's japanese and it harks back to a 1960s tokusatsu tv series that was crazy popular in japan hold that thought i'm gonna go get a prop that's better. It's called Shin Ultraman, or in Japanese, Shin Uturoman, which I'd mispronounce, of course. And it's a reboot, because Shin means new in Japanese. It's a reboot of the old Ultraman TV series from the 1960s. I.G. Suburaya in the 1960s was the guy who created all of the miniature sets for Godzilla movies. He had his own company that built those things, and he had a ton of sets left over. So he decided he needed to make a TV series to get a little extra value out of the sets he'd built for Godzilla and other kaiju movies for Toho Films. And so he came up with the idea for Ultraman. The Ultraman story is pretty simple. There's a special government agency in Japan that deals with kaiju and alien threats. What they don't know is that one of their own agents is actually an alien who can turn into a giant version of himself called Ultraman, who then fights the kaiju one-on-one two rubber suited monster guys going up against each other this is one of the ultraman figures that i got in japan in five years ago so pretty much that's what the guy looks like this is another iteration of ultraman that i'm not familiar with shin ultraman is a 2022 reboot did really well because people were starting to go back to the cinemas after the spicy cough people were remembering all the different series and previous movies of ultraman quite fondly it's kind of fun it's not enormously budgeted but it follows the main plot line of the original series pretty well. There's the agency which is fighting a whole bunch of different kaiju. And there's some really groovy looking kaiju in this movie. There are tunneling kaiju, there are flying kaiju. There's an invisible kaiju which only becomes visible under certain conditions. And the agencies try to fight them and it's doing very well. It's got a big database of methods to fight kaiju with. It's very smart about doing it. It's got plans, it's got resources. It's got the ability to bring in weapons from overseas, which they buy off the Americans, and deal with kaiju. They come up against one they can't deal with, and Ultraman turns up. Giant alien, look at a bit like that, who has the ability to fight off the kaiju. He is secretly inhabiting and sharing the body of one of the agents of the agency, and he's kind of not too cluey about human ways. So when he's disguised as the agent, he comes across as very standoffish and kind of almost neurodiverse in a way. And the other agents of the agency have trouble dealing with him. Meanwhile, the agency comes up against a couple of alien threats, which are really hard to deal with. And one of them, the government and the United Nations try to cut a deal with. And the agency knows that it's a bad deal, but they can't do anything about it. And so they've got to end up fighting these different aliens. It does tend to be a bit episodic Shin Ultraman. But it works well in being a kind of playful, not to be taken too seriously, kaiju thing. There is a sequence in this where one of the female agents becomes kaiju-sized as a kind of test by one of these alien adversaries. And she's kind of zombified and walks around 15 stories tall, becoming almost a threat in her own way. The agency who really can't, don't know what to do with her. And when she does come out of that and turns back to normal size, they have to go into a database and do things like get rid of all the upskirt pictures that people have taken of her when she was giant size because her clothing expanded as well. And the internet is full of upskirt pictures of this particular agent. And so one of the aliens helps them get rid of those pictures. It's not explicitly said in the movie, but it is kind of indicated by some of the text in Japanese on various web pages the movie shows you. So there's some interesting social stuff in there as well. As I said, it's not to be taken too seriously. 
There is a battle in space against a giant robot space station that Ultraman's home planet puts into orbit because they've decided that humanity is a threat and it needs to be destroyed. And Ultraman has to go up against this enormous space station that deal with the existential threat it poses to the human race. It's kind of fun, this one. I, I didn't mind it at all. Not to be taken seriously, the more you know about Ultraman, it's probably better and you'll enjoy the movie better, but it's not really necessary. I came in with only very basic rudimentary knowledge of Ultraman, and I had a good time watching it. It was a bit of fun. It was a little different from the movies I'd just been watching, which is always a nice thing. And it's very cool. So if you get a chance to, check out Shin Ultraman. I know it's been on physical media around the place, which is nice, because not everything is these days. And it's kid-friendly adjacent. If you want to watch it with kids, you're not going to really have too many questions to answer. A lot of fun. Hugs back to earlier era tokusatsu. And I really enjoyed watching it. Next one is an American movie, again from 2022. It says on Wikipedia, an American black comedy slasher film. It was directed by Tim Story, who directed those two Fantastic Four movies. The one with Chris Evans in back in the early 2000s. And it's a fun movie called The Blackening which is a Cabin in the Woods slasher film with pretty much an all-black cast with one notable exception, Diedrich Bader playing the local park ranger and also some of the bad guys. The story is pretty simple. A group of friends have a 10-year reunion up in a country cabin to celebrate Juneteenth. They get up to the cabin and the people who hide the cabin for them, their friends, aren't anywhere around. We know what happens to them because it happens at the start of the film. And they end up finding out that the house is electronically wired to lock all the doors and windows remotely. And somebody is trying to kill them all. And part of the game of killing them is a game called The Blackening, which has a very stereotyped black person's head on the game board. And it has a timer on it. And it asks trivia questions. If you get 10 trivia questions right, you can escape. If you don't, somebody dies. That's the setup for it, and it plays out really well. A lot of the dialogue in this was improvised by the cast of actors, and they're pretty damn good as well. We've got um, Grace Byers, Jermaine Fowler, Melvin Gregg, X Mayo, Dwayne Perkins, Antoinette Roberts, Jay Farrow, who used to be on Saturday Night Live, turns up, and Diedrich Bader, of course, playing the uh, Park Ranger. This one is, is great fun. It's transgressive. The situation of the friends is complicated because uh, most of them are self-medicating on something or other. Some of them are on Molly. One of them takes an Adderall. Another one takes another drug. And that complicates the way they deal with things. It is really, really funny. Uh, it's got a bit of blood and guts in it, which is always fun. You don't know who the bad guy is until most of the way through the film. It plays on those horror movie and science fiction movie tropes of the black guy dying first. And one of the taglines for the movie is, we can't all die first. It is a lot of fun. I know it's on streaming services at the moment. And if you want to have a just a good, enjoyable, not to be taken too seriously, not to be taken as too scary horror movie, the blackening actually worked. I watched it late at night in a semi-darkened room. And it didn't scare me, but it did delight me. It's a lot of fun. Bits of blood and guts. There's a lot of crossbow in this one. And crossbows are innately scary. And the game part of it has little echoes of the Saw franchise. But it doesn't take things to the same extremes that Saw does. You might want to check that one out if you haven't. A lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Then we go back to France for a 2001 horror movie and supernatural horror movie. Directed by Jean-Paul Salome. It's a thing called Belfagor Phantom of the Louvre which is based on a horror novel, Belfagor, which came out in France in 1927. And it's the story of a malevolent spirit that comes out of a mummy which is taken to the Louvre in France and which has its own agenda to basically mess stuff up for modern people. There was a 1965 TV series of it starring Julia Greco, which is only known to francophone people who were watching TV at the time. And she does a little cameo at the start of the film as an old lady in a graveyard. A young woman called Lisa, played by Sophie Marceau, lives close to the Louvre with her grandmother. She gets possessed by this spirit, which is very freakily done. And her and her new boyfriend have to deal with that. Meanwhile, in the Louvre, 
they're trying to find out who keeps stealing artifacts from the Egyptologist section of the Louvre. And a lot of this was filmed in the Louvre, particularly the new parts underneath the pyramid. They even have a little cameo from the Mona Lisa in it. And the cast is really diverse. Michelle Sorol turns up as a detective called Valak, who has a lot of fun in it. There is an Egyptologist played by Julie Christie, and she's an older woman who is an expert in Egyptology. And meanwhile, meanwhile, there are a lot of um, Louvre guards who get severely messed up by this spirit, which is manifesting in a cloak and mask, and nobody realises that it's actually this woman called Lisa being possessed by the spirit. This is a long line of Egyptian mummy movies that the French did. Of course, they did the uh, Extraordinary Adventures of Adele Blancsec. There are a whole bunch of interesting supernatural horror films that France has done around Egypt and around Egyptian mummies and Egyptian tombs and Egyptian pyramids. Um, her grandmother is played by an actress called Patachou, who was a really famous cabaret star in earlier decades. And she is really great in this. Now, this isn't the best supernatural horror film you're ever going to see. But it's uniquely French. And it's got a different viewpoint on horror. And it's got a different way of doing the special effects for horror. And having the film shot in the Louvre gives it a really interesting mise-en-scene. I enjoyed this one. I didn't enjoy it as much as two of the other the first two films. But it's still a bit of fun. It's still something a bit different. And that's what I was looking for by watching movies I hadn't seen before this month. Something a bit different. I had this on my hard drive for a while and just hadn't got around to it. I really liked the cute relationship between her and her boyfriend, who is played uh, by a guy called a guy called uh, Frederick Diefenbaugh plays her boyfriend, and he's got a kind of nice, easy rapport with Sophie Marceau, who goes through some kind of hard stunt work in this movie she does a few of her own stunts and gets thrown around a bit by this spirit and she does that quite well in the film and i do like that early 20th century french supernatural stories they're really something i enjoy they've got a little bit of from georges franju in them because of course he did the adaptation of judex you might want to check this one out bit of fun nothing too heavy nothing too over the top great but still watchable, still entertaining in a nice way to spend a couple of hours. The second to last movie I've got for you is the weakest one. It's an Irwin Allen TV movie from 1976 called Flood with an exclamation mark. Irwin Allen. Allen, after he'd done The Towering Inferno and The Poseidon Adventure, cut a deal to make a few TV movies at a fairly budget rate. And indeed he did. This is basically about a town called Brownsville in Oregon, which is called which is in the real town of Brownsville, which has a large dam above the town. The dam hasn't been maintained and is about to burst because of heavy rainfall upstream. There's a helicopter pilot played by Robert Culp in there. You get Martin Milner playing another guy in the town. And you get this enormous cast of aging character actors playing a lot of the other roles. There's also Barbara Hershey playing Martin Milner's girlfriend, but the cast is pretty impressive. Carol Lindley turns up playing a pregnant lady caught in one of the flooded houses. Roddy Mudell turns up at the start of the film and totally disappears for the rest of the film, playing a guy who wants to go fishing upriver. Cameron Mitchell turns up as an expert on the dam. It's gonna bust, and it's on your head. Your head! Teresa Wright's in there. Um, Leif Garrett. Gloria Stewart, who later turned up in Titanic, is there. Richard Basehart playing the town mayor. Whit Bissell turns up. Um, Anne Doran. A whole bunch of these character actors from the 1940s and 50s turn up playing townspeople in this. And the special effects are, let's just call it rudimentary. They are really ordinary, even for TV at the time. And you can tell people like Robert Culp and Martin Milner and Cameron Mitchell and Richard Basehart and Rodney McDowell are just cashing a check. They're coming in, doing a job of work. They don't really have to do any heavy lifting emotionally in this movie. They do the job, get in, get out, stay clean. Uh, I kind of liked it because it is a reminder of a certain period of television movies in America, which got in a bunch of well-known people. And 
and had a pretty high premise. A town is threatened by a dam bursting unexpectedly. And of course, it, because it's 1976, they've got the town mayor denying that anything's wrong. Very much in a Murray Hamilton Jaws kind of way. I put this town back on the map. And every decision I ever made was for the good of these people. And it still is. John, don't you realize what could happen? You know the pressure behind that dam. If it goes, the lake goes with it, right down through that canyon like Niagara Falls. It'll wipe out this town and everyone in it. Because Jaws influenced every movie that came out that had this kind of theme for the next decade. And this movie is definitely no exception. It's not memorable at all, but I kind of like Robert Cobb, so I enjoyed watching him in this movie. It gives his character some credibility and a little bit of a backstory, which is just that little bit extra above what you normally get in this kind of film so if you get a chance to i believe it is on youtube check out flood it's going to be a nostalgia kick if nothing else and the special effects are something you can enjoy with your tongue very much in your cheek last one i've got for you is a very transgressive japanese movie from 2008 tokyo gore police it was directed by yoshihiro nishimura who was known as the tom savini of japan he was a physical, practical, gore effects guy. And he decided to make this movie about a slightly futuristic dystopian Japan where the Tokyo police force has been privatised. Society has become really weird in the sense that there are ads for really horrible products like knives for young girls to self-harm with and samurai swords you can commit seppuku with. You get a lot of those little ads interspersed in the movie. But the story is about a young woman called Ruka, whose father was a policeman who got shot in the line of duty because he was protesting against the privatisation of the police force. She saw this when she was a young girl. She's now a part of the Tokyo Police Force Corporation, and they've come up against a new menace. A bunch of people, and I use the term people very loosely, called engineers who have a key-shaped gland inside them, which enables them, when they are cut, or in other ways, their skin is split, they can merge with machinery, or they can mutate into other forms. And so Ruka and the police force goes up against these engineers, who are almost unstoppable. You've got to shoot them in the head to kill them. And there's a war between the key man, who is the head of the engineers, and the police force. And as the movie progresses, it becomes increasingly blurred as to which side is the bad guy. Ruka is played by um, Aihi Shina, who you might remember was the young Japanese woman in Takeshi Miike's audition, which is one of the most horrible and transgressive horror movies of, of 1999. Audition, in fact, is getting a new Blu-ray release here in Australia soon. And I hope to get a copy of it. But she's in there as Ruka. Her character gets some interesting beats. She has a, a close friend who is the hostess in a small Japanese bar. You know, one of those little backstreet bars with six seats. And she kind of is the only human contact that Ruka has. She's very alienated. She was raised by her boss who's in charge of the police force. Who is an incredible piece of shit and suddenly she's going up against these superhuman mutated beings whose body parts can mutate who can merge with chainsaws and guns and who are not scared of spilling a bit of blood when required this movie is full-on gore and guts and is, yet it's a comedy it gets transgressive it's like a Stuart gordon reanimator movie but it makes Stuart Gordon look like the guy who did Paddington 2, Paul King. It goes extreme, and it goes totally over the top. And just when you think it's plateaued, and you think that there can't be anything more transgressive than this, the movie takes us to a nightclub come brothel, where things are incredibly worse, and incredibly more transgressive, and incredibly WTF in an over-the-top, outrageous, icky way. There's a lot of blood in this. There's a lot of dismemberment. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of crazy stuff in there. There's a nice sequence. There. Rooker's on a crowded train, and some guy tries to feel her up. So she gets him in an arm lock, 
takes him out of the train station to an alley and makes sure that he's not going to be filling up any women on trains ever again. I can get on board with that part of the film. It really is crazy. There are so many practical special effects in here that are done really well. But the amount and the colour of the gore and the blood makes it a little bit abstract. The blood doesn't look like real blood. The gore is all gelatinous muck. So it doesn't always look like real humans' entrails. Though there are a few intestines that show up now and then. But this is a wild Japanese film in the same way that movies like Tetsuo the Iron Man are. Though this was made on a much larger budget. And the direction is really good as well. There are different stylistic choices that the director makes in various parts of the film. There's a bit of shaky cam which almost mocks the trend for shaky cam in the early 21st century. There are some really nice bits of quiet, suspenseful escalation that happen in the movie. There are bits where you think, okay, this movie is going in one direction and this action scene is going to go here where it ends up going somewhere totally different and totally beyond your expectations and totally beyond your imagination. Tokyo Gore Police, for people who like that kind of film, is an incredibly wild movie. Now, I'm not going to be able to show you most of the scenes on this video because it'll get demonetized by YouTube. So any of the pictures you're seeing as I talk about this are very carefully selected so that this video stays on point and stays viable. But if you haven't seen it, you can definitely check it out. I know it's been on DVD here in Australia. Eastern Eye put it out on DVD about a decade ago. And there is a Blu-ray release in the UK of Tokyo Gore Police. So if you like that kind of film, you're going to want to see this one. It's, um, it's mad. It's bad. It's gory as hell. So that's the five movies I've got for you this time around. As I dive deeply into weirdness in this no rewatch January. So thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. You can support the channel by becoming a channel member. You can support it by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terrydogsmovies. Next time we've got science fiction Saturday and I've got to find a couple of science fiction movies I've never seen before. So I better get started on that project. And until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some outlier movies that have not really been on your radar, even if they'd come out a few years ago. And just sit back and enjoy the weirdness. And I'll catch you next time.